Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Center for Comparative Immigration Studies at UC San Diego. My name is David Fitzgerald, and we're very happy to continue our Friday Migration book panel series with our co-hosts at the uh, University of California, Los Angeles Center for the Study of International Migration, uh, Roger Waldinger from UCLA and Clara Dida uh, from UC San Diego are also organizers on this call. Um, each of the books that we were talking about in this series seek to explain what's behind the newspaper headlines coming from different perspectives in the social sciences, history, and law. Next week on October 23rd, We'll be discussing Divided by the Wall, Progressive and Conservative Immigration Politics at the U.S.-Mexico border by Professor Amine Fidan al Chiolu. Uh, you can get the full schedule of events at the websites of either of our centers. But today we're going to be discussing uh, Exit and Voice, The Paradox of Cross-Border Migration Politics in Mexico by Professor Lauren Duquette-Rury of Wayne State University, Department of Sociology, uh, this is part of the University of California series that allows for a free download of the PDF of the book, or you can uh, order it as you would any other book to get a, a hard copy. Our discussant today is uh, our colleague, Professor Abigail Andrews. She is Associate Professor of Sociology at UC San Diego, as well as the Director of the Mexican Migration Field Research Program. She has also written uh, widely about related issues, including her book from the University of California Press, Undocumented Politics, Place, Gender, and the Pathways of Mexican Migrants. Uh, today's event is being recorded. You'll be able to catch it up or share this with your, your colleagues later if you're interested at the uh, CCIS YouTube uh, site. Uh, first, we're going to hear a quick summary of the book from Lauren, uh, followed by a 10-minute comment from Abigail. Lauren will have about five minutes to respond. At any point, um, everyone who is participating in this event is welcome to ask a question or write a comment using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And for the last 25 minutes or so, uh, we'll have a chance for Lauren to respond uh, in a moderated Q&A. Uh, so Lauren, uh, welcome. And uh, tell us about the paradox of cross-border politics in Mexico. Wonderful. Thank you, David, for the introduction and for the invitation. Um, it's a homecoming of sorts uh, to my UCLA colleagues, uh, to friends at UCSD, and I'm thrilled to be here and discuss the book with you. I'm going to share my screen and, and then we'll chat. Okay, can I get a thumbs up if you can see it okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, the book Exit and Voice, The Paradox of Cross-Border Politics in Mexico was motivated by my interest in studying how remittances, uh, the money that migrants send back to their countries of origin affect uh, politics in, uh, this, in the sending locale. And what was particularly interesting to me was to think about the ways in which migrants' loyalty and social connectivity to the hometown created social networks of giving um, in, in, in the mode of uh, transnational remittances that were of a collective variety. So I, I study migrant remittances that are sent by groups of migrants uh, that have an affiliation in organizations, uh, often called hometown associations, uh, based on their shared affiliation, uh, dual loyalties and connections to the hometown what uh, some sociologists and others have referred to as topophilic attachments. And they send, they pool their resources together and they send this money back, not to individual households, uh, back, back to their communities of origin. And they fund important public goods and services that I'll talk about um, in the remainder of the talk. What was particularly interesting to me is that when you think about uh, migrant remittances, the collective variety in comparison to family remittances, they're but a drop in the bucket. They're really talking about pennies, right? Um, in, a, in the average fiscal year, um, migrant remit, migrants send back about 
anywhere from uh, 23 billion to 27 billion dollars back to households, right? Private transfers to, through private parties and private networks. What's different about collective remittances is that they have a public character to them in that private actors, migrants are sending this money, not back to individual households, but they're sending it back to their hometowns. And this money is often, um, uh, the local, the state, and the national government provide contributions that amplify these resources for various public goods. And so what was really interesting and striking to me was to understand the political consequences of this particular form uh, of, of transnational financial flows, which we know are imbued uh, with social meanings as well. So the motivating research question, um, uh, the theoretical one, is really how do transnational how does transnational migration affect democracy in origin countries? And here we could think about it at, at an individual level. Here I'm thinking about it at, at more of a meso level and thinking about it in terms of local democracy. What really is underneath uh, this more general theoretical question is really one about who has the legitimate authority to speak for whom in a political community? Um, what I learned through my field work and through the quantitative analysis is that um, often in the study of hometown associations and their participation in their um, local networks and back in their origin communities, we often take for granted that the social connectivity is really quite heterogeneous. Right? And the ways in which um, that shared attachment is received by and becomes uh, co-constitutive of the ways in which migrants participate is really what needs to be explained and shouldn't be taken uh, for granted. The empirical approach I use in the book um, is a multi-method approach. Uh, it is what uh, some people have referred to as an integrative research design, meaning one of the methods builds on another method in a se sequential order. So I first conducted an original transnational survey instrument of all Mexican hometown associations that were registered with the Mexican government. There are limitations to that, which I'm happy to describe. Um, from that survey, I began to study the quality and the content of the social relationships, as well as the levels of migrant, uh, excuse me, of government engagement. And I was able to then select from those participants in the research uh, six cases to study in field uh, using a comparative research design uh, in Mexico. I uh, spent time in five mun municipalities in three different states, Guanajuato, Jalisco, and Zacatecas. Um, you'll notice I say six cases, but in five municipalities, because in one of the municipalities, I studied two different transnational partnerships to allow for holding some um, more macro structural uh, factors constant and to really try and go deeper into the quality and the content of the social embeddedness of the migrants. After the fieldwork was completed, I then did a, a statistical analysis using a difference and difference approach um, of all Mexican municipalities uh, from 1990 to 2013 to try and understand if what I was uh, witnessing and observing in the micro uh, procession in a micro processual way was evident uh, in a more syst systematic way um, across all municipalities. Okay. Now here, um, I'm just showing you a picture of the different types of public goods projects that were mobilized by migrant collective remittances. Um, migrants sent money to fund potable water projects, uh, schools, this is a one room uh, kindergarten in one of the cases that I studied, uh, public spadings like um, you know, town squares, they funded drainage and sanitation, roads, sidewalks, electricity, just to give you um, a, sense, a sense of the variation of projects that were funded. Um, but the point that I'll be making to you and, and that I uh, try and lay out in the book is that it's not just about migrants sending money and public goods projects coming to be. Really what we begin to understand if we use studying collective remittances and public goods provision as a window is how democracy works in places where there's high levels of outmigration. 
When migrants become non-state actors or are non-state actors involved in the public provision, something that has been otherwise under the complete auspices of the local government um, because of decentralization reforms in Mexico over the years, um, what happens is you have often lots of contestation for power, authority, voice, and this discussion about who gets to make decisions for whom um, in the town. When migrants begin to make decisions about wanting to supply uh, potable water, and this might not be in alignment with the preferences of uh, the most vocal local citizens, uh, we begin to see the politics emerge. In some of those cases, which I'll uh, describe in the next slide, um, we see what I call synergy. Uh, where community members become um, embedded in the process of co-producing public works with the state. And this opens up new forms of participatory engagement in which local citizens, uh, their elected representatives and the migrants together are selecting projects, um, negotiating uh, budgets, uh, working on monitoring uh, the implementation and overseeing of the different various uh, public works that occur. They're making decisions about how those resources are distributed within the municipality and in outlying communities. And you get the creation of routinized forms of deliberation um, and engagement between uh, local citizens who may not otherwise have had access to their local representatives because migrants have now facilitated a vertical, uh, a vertical relationship to the state based on their social relationships with those who remain behind, so to speak. Okay. So here you'll see uh, a couple of uh, different boxes. On one side, you'll see the distribution of comparative cases by what I call transnational partnership type. Um, this is loosely based on uh, Eleanor Ostrom's idea of co-production, but moving beyond the confines of the nation state to really think and broaden co-production in a transnational sphere in which remittances are mobilizing different forms of public goods provision between state on the one hand and migrants. I look here at um, two forms of, of, of structural factors that I that I believe organize uh, the co-production partnerships or the transnational partnerships. On the one hand, you have the government actors who can be highly engaged, meeting their contributions, uh, engaging in the selection of projects, or completely shirking on their responsibilities and allowing the migrants, and in some cases, local citizens, uh, to substitute for, uh, for the provision of public goods entirely. Uh, on the other hand, you have uh, the degree of uh, community engagement or community inclusion, how involved local citizens are in participating in the repertoire of activities uh, involved in the production of public goods. So this is a form of typological theorizing in which you'll see variation along the two different axes. And we can think about different types of co-production as being um, constituted in these different quadrants from what I call synergy in which there's high levels of engagement and uh, community inclusion to more corporatist partnerships where the government and the H and the hometown associations have formed an alliance to the exclusion of local voices uh, to fragmented ties in which there's neither community engagement or uh, high levels of government engagement and the um, migrants become the uh, really the access around decision making for public goods and in the far I don't know my right from my left, you're looking at the screen, but in the bottom corner, the uh, substitutive case in which citizens working together with migrants are really substituting for the state in the provision of public goods using, uh, using their remittance resources. On the other side of the screen, you'll see the cases where I did my field work, a map, um, but you'll also see the cases broken down along uh, these axes of community inclusion and engagement. And you'll notice uh, names of towns, Atitlan, El Cerrito, Aguacato, etc. In some of those boxes, you might see the same name of the municipality more than once. And that's because these are very fluid, dynamic partnerships that change as a function of the changing social relationships that happen between the migrants on the one hand, local citizens on the other, and the ways in which local government observes and is implicated in these social relationships and thus changes in their levels of participation over time.
I have no idea if I'm doing okay um, on time. So if I if if I get if I go over, um, rein me in, David. Okay. Um, maybe I'll just say a little bit about one of the cases to kind of tease out uh, the mechanisms and how they work. Um, I think it's it's often um, most instructive to look at a case of failure um, first. So I'll tease out the case of Atitlan Jalisco, where a case of corporatism corporatism devolved into failure. And this was a function of migrants who were never really socially embedded in the hometown. And they failed to construct meaningful social ties to key stakeholders in the community. In this case, it was the local patronato who ran the annual patron saint festival, a very important local uh, institution in uh, many Mexican municipalities, and especially in Atitlan. In the second case, uh, we'll see the case of El Cerrito, Guanajuato, in which the government was not heavily involved in the co-production process. Migrants were contributing their resources, uh, but the government was not, and they were continuing to do public works projects uh, through a program called the Three for One program. Um, but also local citizens weren't involved, and that's because uh, migrants over time spent in the United States, their social ties had been taxed, they had waned, and they didn't know very many people left in the town. Initially, they were perceived as outsiders. But the difference here was that the lack of what we've called social capital, right, the trust, reciprocity, be imbued in social ties um, wasn't a death sentence for this partnerships because the because the migrants uh, constructed social ties anew and renegotiated their membership in the social community, which allowed them to exercise political voice based on solidarity and not based on hierarchies of power and status. So in the first case, um, I think this is a really uh, instructive quote. Uh, this was a meeting. Uh, I was in the corner um, where the patronato, the leaders of the patronato were meeting um, without the HTA leader present. They were back in um, El Paso, Texas, where they were from. And this is a point at which there was a lot of consternation about the patronato not being a part of the negotiations between the hometown association and and uh, the municipal uh, elected officials, the mayor and the director of public works. At this point in um, the, you know, the history of the partnership, um, the patronato was asking the hometown association to be part of a, of a concrete vehicle bridge that they had proposed uh, between the government and the HTA. And they wanted the patronato to commit resources, but they didn't want their uh, their substantive involvement. They had lots of ideas in the town for what they needed. In fact, they really wanted public lighting because they were having some issues of the school children traveling to and from the bus stop. So here we have a local member of the patronato saying in the absence of the migrants um, who were not present at the meeting, you know, who does this guy think he is showing up here and telling us what is best? I don't care if he still owns a house here. I've never seen him around. And then the real kicker is he even Mexican anymore because he had been out of the hometown for so long living in Texas. We have our own money. This is the money from the patronato raised every year. Why can't we work with the mayor on our own projects? And so what this case reveals is when the local citizens perceive the HTA as being in an alliance with the local government to the exclusion of those who are considered to be the stakeholders and the leaders of the, of the hometown, right, in the absence of the migrants. There is contestation for power. There is uh, the, trans, uh, the transmission of, and signaling of ideas about uh, exclusion and what it means to belong. And in this case, it led to failure. Um, the uh, many things happened, uh, many nefarious things happened. Um, but to sum up the case, uh, the patronato works together with the rest of the local community and they decide to sanction the hometown association, the migrant leaders. They um, try a couple of projects and they fail at every turn because of the um, inequality um, in the voice that is given to the hometown association leaders in the absence of voice given to the hometowners and the hometown association no longer wants to deal uh, with the, the contestation and they disband. By contrast, 
In the case of El Cerrito, even though the hometown association, the migrants did not have um, social ties uh, that were pre-existing that would lend itself to the involvement of both the government and uh, local citizens, they constructed those ties uh, through a series of rodeo, uh, rodeos and dances, what I call cultural repertoires of community membership. They renegotiated their membership by um, participating in the everyday affairs of the hometown and in meaning so meaningful social engagements and events um, that re-signal that renegotiated their membership, these building of bridging ties um, that occurred over time. Um, and what happens is, I'll show you in the next slide, we see a scaling up of civic engagement. People who had no, had no interest in participating in the hometown um, began asking the hometown association leaders, you know, can you do this project for us? Can you do this project for us? They would email, you know, send them notes over Facebook um, saying we'd love to pave this road. And there's so much engagement that they actually um, form citizen block committees um, in which the hometown association really hands over the keys uh, to these local citizen block committees and uh, they provide the money. Uh, and partner with the local government, but these two groups that you see down here, the Hawks, who uh, named themselves the watchdogs of the hometown associations, um, of the hometown association, begin to partner and build up a civic association in the town that they get registered with the local government. And one of the members actually becomes a liaison to uh, the local mayor. So I block out some of their faces because uh, I imagine someone will ask me about violence and the role of violence and I've blocked out their faces and I can tell you a little bit about what's happened to this case since I left the field in 2011. But to suffice it to say, this is a case of, of synergy par excellence. We have hometown association leaders that renegotiated the, the, the content and the quality of their ties in the town, um, created bridging ties. Uh, local citizens responded by participating uh, more over time and with every subsequent project and witnessing the escalation of civic involvement. Uh, the local mayors decided to up their engagement. And when I asked the local mayor about this, um, when I was in the town, he would say, well, we can't be showed up by migrants. This is an election year. It was very important for them to try and claim credit for projects, um, especially when citizens were aware of how resources were spent. What this means um, in sum is uh, how do I operationalize you know, success? Well, I operationalized it in a number of different ways. When I looked at voter turnout, right, just to see if the share of the population that was eligible to vote increases in the hometown uh, and looking at before the first hometown partnership and then uh, partnerships and time after, right, after, after uh, subsequent engagement. I looked at the share of uh, government public spending on public works to see if that increased as a function of different kinds of transnational partnerships. Um, and I also looked at the creation of civic engagement. Here I relied on the Mexican Family Life Survey in order to get a better sense of how many civic associations there were in the towns and how that changed over time as a function of migrant involvement. And what we find is uh, in places in which you have more long-standing cumulative participation in which citizens are more engaged in the product, pro projects as a function of their social ties, uh, we see higher shares of municipal public spending on public works. We see a variation in the distribution of how those resources are spent, right, beyond the Cabecera Municipal, which is the county seat, into outlying communities where some of them had never seen a public works project since the 70s and 80s. We also see the escalation of non-electoral forms of participatory engagement where citizens uh, take, you know, become involved in letter writing campaigns um, or form new rotary clubs because they want to start solving their their own local problems, um, not not just with the migrants, but independently. Okay, this is my last slide. I hope I'm doing okay on time.
There's a couple of key contributions I think that the book makes and, 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 and really is an invitation for more work that looks back, uh, back to the hometown, back to countries of origin to really begin to understand how voice uh, can be predicated on exit. Um, this is obviously I'm, I'm very uh, wedded and rely on Hirschman's uh, very important triptych here, but that we shouldn't take for granted that belonging um, is the same everywhere. That belonging is actually quite heterogeneous and that citizenship is embedded in and constitutive of community. That's very difficult to dis disentangle these ideas. And what allows for the legitimate use of political voice is the idea of social membership that's really fundamental to ideas of community. Uh, the late Kim Berry wrote about this um, from, a, from a legal standpoint. Um, you should check out her work. I think, it's, I think David brought it to my attention. It's really um, an important piece. Um, this is the, the Peter Evans side of me coming out, the second note. It's not really about how much money is being sent home, but about what it does, what kind of transnational uh, partnership, how it facilitates different modes of engagement um, outside of electoral spheres, but also in the electoral sphere. If we want to understand participatory democracy, we want to understand what leads to improvements in government responsiveness and engagement, we should be um, paying more attention to the complexity and the content of social ties in the transnational social network. Um, and, and it goes without saying, instead of focusing almost exclusively on domestic factors that shape uh, local democratic governance. I think uh, maybe the last thing I'll say is that um, exit creates the conditions of possibility for voice, but it is it is fundamentally constrained by the nature of those social relationships. Um, and these social relationships and the structure of politics in the hometown pre-exist, but it can be transformed by migrant collective action. So it's not enough to say that migrants, because they maintain social ties, um, uh, our political members. No, this is precisely what I argue needs to be disentangled and should be understood um, thinking about the structure and the quality of those social ties maintained and forged anew over time. So I'll stop there. Let me unshare my screen and turn it over to Abby. Hey, um, it was a real joy to come back to this book. Um, here's my product placement, though you can get it for free online <laughs> as well, um, which I had the privilege of reading in draft form and was able to revisit now. And I was just struck again by how astonishing this range and scope of field work is. Um, Lauren did ethnography in five different places. Um, she did an original survey and she did complex statistical analysis of the entire Mexican census. So this is just a scope that is above and beyond, I think what we see in the vast majority of books and just gives her this fluidity between um, sort of the micro level and the process and negotiation involved in building um, in building relationships and building in co-constructing public goods, um, but also allows her to sort of scale up and out and look at the meso and macro level um, and how these play out writ large. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, I also think that the book asks both an important empirical question of sort of um, how and under what conditions can co-production be most effective that reflects this important sort of broader theoretical question that she frames as who belongs and who has legitimate authority in a political community. But I would also frame as um, something more nuanced, which is how is how are ties and relationships that enable um, public goods constructed, negotiated, and built as part of a process and a practice? And I think that the example that she, the comparative examples that she gave, where in one case, they were not able to build that. And in the other, um, they didn't necessarily have pre-existing ties, but in the practice of engaging actually sort of built relationships and built the ties that enabled successful co-production, 
that is the richness that we get out of the ethnographic um, side of this is seeing um, this isn't just a sort of factors and conditions question. It is actually a processual question where um, people um, create community uh, out of the actions they undertake. Um, and I think that sheds really important light on this question of loyalty, right? We have this triptych of exit voice and loyalty that has framed so much thinking about how immigrants abroad engage in their home countries. Um, and Lauren really draws important attention to this question of loyalty and what role it plays in the interplay between exit and voice. Um, and, I, and I think that what she shows is that loyalty isn't just present or absent, it is built. Um, and that what loyalty is really is social belonging, social cohesion, um, a sense of community, um, and that that has to be act actively constructed. I also think she draws really important attention to the character and conditions on the sending side. Um, most migration literature, of course, focuses on the agency of the migrants. Um, and she, I think, is part of sort of a, a rising shift to think about not just what are migrants doing to their home communities, but what is the interplay and tensions and struggles between them. Um, and I have to say that in the context of the pandemic where everything we're doing is from afar um, and we're trying and we're sort of in a um, moment of struggles for social cohesion, this feels very relevant. And then finally, I just wanted to bring up the conclusion that she alluded to in the talk, but goes more in depth in the conclusion of the book about the transformation of Mexican migration to net zero flow and the really rising role of organized crime and violence um, overlapping with the state. And I almost um, said, as I was rereading the conclusion, wanted another book on this. Mm -hmm. um, sort of what becomes of this co-production and interplay with the state in the presence of this, of these very powerful parastate actors who are themselves, um, you know, intertwined with the state, and what becomes of migrants' loyalty? What becomes of the capacity to build social cohesion? Um, I suspect it's harder. Let's just put it that way. Mm -hmm. But I want I wanted to hear more about this, right? Um, as Mexican migration falls to zero, can we build social cohesion among the second generation that crosses borders? Uh, what, what are the prospects in this context of violence that is driving people out again as refugees um, from communities in Mexico? And I'd just like to hear a bit more about that. Um, and I think that's kind of part of a broader question I have about this sort of um, shifting context and conditions on each end. Um, I guess I have one more small question um, before I turn it back over to you, which is sort of, I, I think the state plays a shifting role in this story. In some parts of the story, it seems really external to the communities. Um, there's sort of state community and migrants as these three elements. Um, but I just wonder to what extent sort of state and, you know, there are elements of the state that are members of the community, right? And the community has some form of local state. And often, um, for instance, there is a long history of pre-involvement in communities in Mexico and um, rural individuals being involved with the PRI and being leaders for the PRI and having sometimes a close relationship or to other political parties, right? So, so I guess I just am questioning the sort of separation of the state in the conceptualization of, of, of the research. Um, but yes, it's, it's an amazing book. I think it leads to so much important rethinking and you should all read it. Lauren, um, at this point, if you would like to take five minutes to uh, answer the easier questions and uh, pivot away from the harder questions, okay. and, and then we'll open it up to the other discussion. Awesome. Um, thanks, Abigail, for your lovely comments. That was a very generous reading of the book. And it's also, I really love hearing other people's reframing of something 
something that um, you've been working on for what, 10 plus years now. Um, it's really helpful to hear it through your filter, um, especially given um, the work that you do. So it takes on a different kind of resonance when I hear it um, you know, coming through, through your filter. And I, I really appreciate that. Um, so on, on the first couple of points, I think that, that yeah, I, I, I completely agree and you're absolutely right. It, loyalty, I mean, the book starts from a place of loyalty. All of the migrants that engage in co-production um, would espouse to some loyalty the hometown in, 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 in one way or another, but it's really about unpacking the, con you know, what, what makes up that loyalty and is it, uh, you know, is it, being construed in the same way by those uh, citizens remaining behind um, who are being invoked in this idea of loyalty and membership in the hometown. And I, and I love the language of cohesion um, that you used there. Um, I, there's a lot of really great questions that I imagine are gonna come up. So I'll just say about the interplay and the struggles um, and the relevance of, of COVID now, um, I think this is an area ripe for uh, more research, right? So I'm gonna take your comment as an invitation uh, to others to um, begin to help me and other, and other scholars really try and understand what happens when there's some kind of exogenous shock that inter interrupts what we, what we consider to be social cohesion. Violence is one kind of factor that does that in the Mexican context. And, and I'm happy to discuss more about what that means um, in terms of these partnerships, although I imagine there might be a question from the audience about that. Um, but because so much of what we're doing now is remote, migrants in, in most cases, certainly the ones that I've kept in touch with, must have some kind of mirror club, uh, which we call espejo clubes, or other kinds of uh, stakeholders that can work in conjunction or in the absence of the migrants who can no longer visit um, the hometown, right? So it really shows for me and, and what I've heard from my informants is really the, the necessity of that uh, community inclusion at the local level. And if it wasn't there before, it's, it's the migrants who are continuing to engage are trying to facilitate these social ties now, although it's incredibly difficult um, to do in this climate and also with the ending of the three for one program, which was the major, major administrative program that facilitated the flow of remittances. So maybe I'll stop there and then it can pick up on some of these themes um, as, we, as we go through the Q&A and hold me to it because I have lots to say about uh, violence as well. Thanks. So there are some truly excellent questions. Instead of just marching through them, I'm going to collate them into themes and piggybacking off what you said about exogenous shocks. We have several related questions from the UCLA diaspora. Um, so I'm going to throw out two of them and then you can respond. Uh, one is coming from uh, Professor Ruben Hernandez Leon. What do you think will happen to collective remittances and migrant participation in communities of origin now that the Mexican government has eliminated the three for one mm -hmm. program and has disengaged from organizing migrants in the US? So that's one, this disengagement yeah. from the Mexican government in this program. Number two, from Professor Menjo, um, how did changing nation state relations, such as the Trump administration's restrictivist and hostile stand on Mexican migration and cross border engagement, affect these grassroots transnational practices? Hi, Ruben. Hi, Min. I can't see you, but thank you for your wonderful questions. Um, so, Ruben, I love this question because also you gave me the tip off. I remember you had a visit with, um, at the consulate and, and you came back and you said, I don't know, I think this program is going to be gone soon. And it really forced me in that moment to think, well, what would become of these partnerships in the absence of the administrative body that uh, amplified migrant resources? And now we're witnessing it. So what we've seen is the following, um, and certainly this is just my uh, my witness uh, my witnessing. There, there's probably other things going on that I've not been privy to. But on the one hand, we've seen the escalation of state level matching programs. Um, so in the absence of the federal contribution, right? So um, her, but you don't have to forgive me if I didn't explain the three for one program. It is a, a social welfare program in which the federal, the state and the local government matched every dollar that migrant hometown associations sent back to their um, places of origin to fund public works. What we're seeing is an escalation of the state um, in this involvement. 
um, in the absence of the federal contributions. So um, hometown associations haven't completely disbanded or stopped their work. In some cases, they've increased it um, because of um, uh, you know, different kinds of crises going on. Um, but the, what I have found is it is the hometown associations that the have the highest level of organizational capacity and that are oftentimes uh, members of the Federation of Migrant Clubs that have been able to continue their work apace um, and certainly at it has been scaled back. Another um, effect we've seen um, in the absence of the three for one program is many migrant clubs trying to find other kinds of social programs uh, at the local level, at the state level, and at the federal level that they can qualify for to get some kind of additional matching in addition to uh, local municipalities. Um, I've seen uh, the club in El Cerrito has done this. Um, they've gone outside of the state level three for one program, which many allege is really quite corrupt these days, um, and in some cases has been extorted um, by uh, local gang activity, and to try and find other kinds of state level um, uh, resources that they can then um, mobilize for public works. And finally, um, we've seen uh, more spontaneous uh, partnerships outside of this kind of formal arrangement that happened through the three for one program. So we're seeing local citizens organizations like Lions Clubs, Rotary Clubs, church groups working directly with the hometown association, sometimes with the support of the local government and sometimes without. And I think that's one of the limitations, but also the possibilities for future research, which is I studied these partnerships through a major um, federal program, but in the absence of that federal program, how does the nature of community engagement and government and uh, community inclusion change um, when there's a more spontaneous informal partnerships? I think that's kind of the next iteration of this work. Um, Min, uh, thank you for the question about you know, hostility and bilateral uh, geopolitical relationships between countries, right? Thinking about uh, certainly the Mexican US case, but we can, we can think beyond um, to other kinds of bilateral uh, relationships. I think this is really important. And I think um, in some cases, at least uh, the migrants that I'm talking to now, it's mobilized them um, anew. Right, so we've seen uh, migrants uh, become more politically active in the home in the hometown. Um, you know you, what Jose Itzigzon and, and and others had called a kind of reactive transnationalism. Right, with the escalation of hostility. And the targeting, uh, I know David, some of your more recent look looks at the targeting of co-ethnic community members, not just migrants, but other Latinos who, who have a pan-ethnic identity more broadly, becoming more engaged in uh, the hometown. Um, but this is an empirical question. So I think this is another avenue for future research is really to try and unpack um, the ways in which uh, deportees who are becoming reassimilated to varying degrees in the hometown are taking up um, this as a, a, a problem to be solved, or whether they're, you know, becoming more disengaged as a function of the hostility and the relationships and their experiences in the U.S. I know Abigail's work um, speaks to this question in, in, um, in a particular way uh, that's very important, but given net zero immigration and uh, forced and voluntary flows of, of uh, former migrants back to their communities of origin, we're really going to need to see how returnees are reshaping the political landscape at the local level. Thanks, Lauren. Now we have a couple of questions from Jennifer Martinez, which I'll summarize here. You mentioned that there are several different kinds of these collective projects, such as patronize or, or sponsoring the, uh, the, the patron saint fiesta or uh, various amenities projects. Does the type of project affect the political consequences? Mm. And then separately, can you say something about the difference between the political consequences of these collective projects and private household level remittances? Sure, I, I really appreciate the first question. Um, so there's, there's kind of a, a two ways of answering this. The first is, um, so the three for one data that I used um, in the statistical analysis is, is a bit of a messy data set. So the, the data we have on the type of project is not great. But what we do have um, suggests that it is not about the type of the project that matters as much as how many projects happen consecutively and cumulatively over time, and whether those projects are in the county seat or whether they're in an outlying community. Um, 
projects that uh, have this cumulative nature to them or quality to them that are in outlying communities tended to have the most synergistic effects. And that could be a function of the size of the outlying community, that uh, bonding and bridging ties were um, more easy to, uh, to forge or to reforge in their absence in those places um, than in the Cabecera Municipal, which has a higher level of population. So I didn't see type driving political outcome. I saw the location um, and also the organizational capacity of the hometown association. Hometown associations that had a larger membership, that had learned over time a process of social and political learning, how to run their organizations more effectively. Um, they learned from other clubs if they were members of federations, tended to have the best kinds of outcomes in terms of uh, ratcheting up political and civic engagement as opposed to type of project. Okay, uh, Nadja Al-Masalhi, who is doing work on transnational Syrian American activism has a question about the scope conditions for uh, effective uh, partnerships. Um, does it matter whether the origin country's government is functional or democratic? Um, that's a great question. So, you know, one of the reasons why there are a lot of reasons why I chose uh, Mexico to study these processes. There's a lot of previous research on the case. I speak Spanish, um, but uh, it, it seems like a critical case to me. And critical case meaning that if we would expect these types of partnerships to facilitate new forms of participatory engagement or participatory development and democracy, I would expect it to be in Mexico where we have the longest duration of, you know, one of the longer durations of hometown associations as a function of the um, migrant settlement patterns and how long uh, the migrant process has been between these two countries. So one of the things I think might be important is then to see how well the theory travels to other cases. I would expect that you need um, um, some functioning capacity for government to do this. But what I'm also seeing in studying the work of someone like uh, Melanie Kamet uh, at Brown, or now she's at Harvard, um, Lily Tsai, um, Lauren McLean, these are political scientists who study the role of non-state actors in facilitating uh, public works and social welfare, is that the non-state actor varies dramatically and sometimes produces similar kinds of political and social ends. So we see Hezbollah providing social welfare resources in the Lebanese case um, with different kinds of political outcomes, but it is still a function of their social ties that local citizens begin to rely on uh, the provision of social welfare in the absence of a functioning state. So I'm not sure if regime type matters, although I will say I did look at um, authoritarian enclaves in the Mexican context at the local level and found that places that had the long duration of an alternation in political power, right? Meaning the PRI was no longer in office. We're more likely to see the kinds of um, partnerships that I refer to as synergistic or at least corporatist because we had lots of government engagement. Okay, well, expanding the scope conditions historically, there's a question from uh, Mitchell here, Andrew Mitchell, um, wondering if you can connect a Mexican case back to older hometown associations such as a Greek or Italian hometown associations at an earlier period in US migration history. Um, what, how can we draw comparisons between those two eras of migration to the US and uh, how remittances were sent back to the country of origin? Is it Andrew? Who, thank you, Andrew. That's Andrew. such an important question. This is a, one of those questions that kind of um, is the one that you wake up in the middle of the night thinking about and you don't have a great answer for. But here I can tell you how I think about it. So one of the things, um, you know, this is uh, you see Hirschman revealing um, his influence on my on my research again, which is he has this ideal of um, of, of social energy. Right, so in places where we have other kinds of pre-existing um, norms of civic engagement, high levels of social capital, one would argue, or one might expect, we would be more likely to see places, uh, hometown associations, where there's um, more heterogeneity and the kinds of ties. I think this is probably true, but I have probably true, but I haven't found a way of testing it empirically. So I think it is likely to be the case that places where you have hometown associations, there is a longer history of 
of social capital and pre-existing social ties, like in the usos y costumbres um, cases in Oaxaca and Chiapas that have high levels of substitution, or excuse me, of synergy. But what we do see is that ties can break down over time. So even if you had a lot of pre-existing times because of a, um, a, an ethno-religious um, shared system of local governance, that we can still see ties break down over time. And I'm not an expert on the Oaxacan case. Um, Abby could certainly speak to this, but um, we have seen cases in which um, hometown associations um, um, have been threatened to not be buried in the hometown if they didn't fulfill their ethno-religious obligations to the community um, in a way that was a representative of the communal voice. So I think that there's something to the question. I just haven't found um, a really um, a robust way of testing it. So if you have ideas, I would, I would love to hear um, more, Andrew. Uh, Fernando Villegas has a question. He notes first that the study focuses on the traditional sending subnational states. However, there are other cases in non-traditional subnational states, um, which have a scenario that resembles more this fragmented type of case. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the example of Sinaloa, where there is a low level of institutional capacity for approaching the uh, Sinaloense diaspora um, in the US. Why is it that some diasporas are recognized and nurtured by home state governments while others are neglected or denied by different actors in both the country of origin and destination? Oh, that's a that's a good question. There's a lot in that question, so I'll do my best um, to answer to answer it fully. Um, so while the um, field work was based in the three states, this is one of the reasons why I also chose to do um, the statistical analysis. So when I look from 1990 to 2013, it's both at places that had transnational partnerships and those places that um, did not, and looks at when the partnerships. Um, appeared right when they were when they were constructed um, and and that's really important because I think you know at, at last count almost 55 percent of municipalities had participated in the three for one program at least once so it was really important to me to see if what I was seeing in the field and in the survey was borne out um, you know across and outside the the traditional sending region as as you say Fernando and we do we did I did see that um, there the break the, the structure of the partnerships is what explained a lot of the variation on the political and the civic outcomes. Now, to the question, um, I also heard in, in your question, um, this, I, this, um, this query to get more of a sense of why some states were active in recruiting the diaspora right into the three for one program and why others were not. And I think this is you know, a function of maybe two things, but it, it certainly could be others. Um, on the one hand, the traditional states had, um, the traditional sending states had a long history and had done a lot to actually monitor the whereabouts out of their paisanos. I know David has done exceptional work on this and he could uh, probably say uh, a lot on this point as well. Um, but when it was time, uh, when the three for one program was ratcheted up to the federal level, many municipal governors who um, had fiscal um, constraints would identify their migrants abroad. The case of Jalisco, they did a very good job of tracking their paisanos. The case of Guanajuato as well. They would come to the United States in these caravans, take people out to dinner, you know, they'd take them for, um, you know, tacos and take pictures, and it would become this kind of state, um, state performance and ask them to form these clubs. That you see a lot more, and we see that variation across states. Um, places that um, were, that joined uh, the, the federal three-for-one program or uh, forged these partnership, partnerships later on, um, it is often through a diffusion effect. Um, there is a geography PhD student, um, he's probably now out in the job market or hopefully landed somewhere. Um, uh, his first name is Aaron and I'm blanking on his last name, who actually took the data that I had and looked at the diffusion and the spread of the partnerships over time. And just as you suggest, Fernando, they start in the traditional sending states and then through a process of diffusion and the, um, um, the sharing of information, maybe a kind of institutional isomorphism, do we see it spread out to places that didn't have tradi weren't traditional um, senders but of, of migrants, but you know, it's, it's 
2020 and I, you know, is there really a municipality that has not been touched by migration at this point? I, I think it would be hard to find one. Uh, Mada Armenta and Nancy Planky Videla would like to invite you to elaborate on what you started to talk about, which was the role of violence in the okay. communities of origin and co-production. Okay, thanks, um, Amada. Uh, I, I appreciate that. I'm sorry I missed the uh, second person's name, but yeah. So um, I don't know if um, my co-author Clarissa Perez Armendariz is here, but uh, Clarissa and I have begun to address this um, question, right? The big elephant in the room of the role of violence um, in our work. We have a recent paper in the Journal of Ethnic and Migration Studies. Clarissa and others are, this is really a burgeoning area for research for any graduate students here. Please help us think through these um, big, huge questions of the role of violence. And what we have found, um, uh, Clarissa and I and some others, um, is that in places where you had hometown associations, where there was this cumulative, uh, what we call synergistic partnerships over time, um, are more likely to have um, out the defensas, these vigilante groups that are formed by uh, local citizens in response to escalating violence, not just violence from the drug trade, um, but, but uh, other kinds of violence um, that are um, both connected to, but also independent of the um, cartel activity. And what we have found is that um, certainly the money is, is likely to play a role, although we don't see collective remittances playing a role. I, we both suspect um, that private remittances are playing a role and, and some work by uh, Covadonga Mesiger, Sandra Ley, and others have been showing that there's a curvilinear effect between remittances and the uh, emergence of vigilante groups that are trying to thwart violence and to, um, to uh, you know, obtain some kind of social order in their hometowns. In the cases with hometown associations, um, migrants and the local citizens are repurposing the organizational capacity they had used for public works, right, a kind of public good now for public security. Okay, so it's not that collective remittances are necessarily funding um, the vigilantes, the purchasing of guns, but it's the organizational network and the social ties that have become, um, we argue, one of the backbones of the creation of the vigilantes um, in, in many parts of Mexico. We see this empirically, and now we're beginning to unpack this uh, qualitatively. We also know that um, outside of the collective remittances phenomena that many uh, migrants who return to Mexico take up arms um, in support of their communities. Um, uh, is it El Americano uh, returns to Mexico? He uh, is, uh, I can't remember if it's himself or one of his family members is kidnapped and because they target him, they know he sends remittance money home. And um, once he's released, he says, you know, screw this. And he becomes a leader of uh, a very, um, a very powerful vigilante organization um, in uh, in in Michoacan. So all of this to say that uh, migrants are playing a very important role in both thwarting violence through the creation of vigilantes, but they also be become implicated in the violence as well, right? So it's not just the case that migrants send the money or they be go back and then, you know, it's, it's good for democracy. And all, in, in many cases, um, they are committing illegal acts. They are uh, participating in extra, uh, extra judicial killings and, um, what we need, we need more research um, in order to begin to understand the really robust nature of uh, migration's impact on, on violence. But that's what I can say about the role of remittances and, and HTAs in particular. All right, I'd like to ask you a, a last question, Lauren, which is, as, yeah. as you know, as we've discussed over the years, I've argued that even though there's so much work on the hometown and, and homeland connections between Mexican migrants and their places of origin, almost all the literature takes a pretty narrow view of who a Mexican migrant is. Yeah. It really focuses overwhelmingly on, on labor migrants or people who originally came as labor migrants. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the actors who have absolutely transformed Mexico, such as political elites who've been schooled in US institutions and then returned to become say president yeah. of Mexico yeah. or exiled leaders like Benito Juarez, or even getting more to the kinds of things we're talking about um, economic, uh, production, uh, you know, very few people are writing about, say, the Mexican-American Chamber of Commerce or what uh, wealthy entrepreneurs from Monterrey who have moved to Dallas are doing back in Mexico. And I'm just wondering, what do you think 
we could take from the kinds of lessons you've learned and, and taught us in this book to understand that broader set of actors in the landscape of, of Mexico US mobility broadly construed? Thanks, David. I always leave it to you to ask the big, broad, sweeping um, questions. And I think that's a really important one. I, uh, there's a couple of ways of answering this. One, I know Alexandra Delano is doing incredible work that gets at precisely this question, right? Um, you're right. In this, in this book, I am looking exclusively at labor migrants, and we would, we would even venture to say an elite, an elite group of migrants that have the resources and the organizational capacity to do this kind of work in addition to their day jobs. But one of the things that was kind of surprising to me that was revealed by the survey um, that I fielded is that there was still a lot of participation from very recent migrants. So, you know, the, the kind of old school idea of, of transnational participation, you know, Guarnizo and Cortes um, and others um, would say that, you know, people who had been in the U.S. the longest period of time were more likely to participate as, you know, their dream of going home begins to fade. And what we find is that if you're, those folks who had been in the US from zero to five years actually were just as likely to be leading organizations as those who had been here and were more established in the United States. And that was a surprising finding to me. Um, I didn't look at it much closer than, than you know, I, identifying it as a finding, but I think that there's a real opportunity to open up the possibilities for different kinds of migrant agency. Um, and I, that's kind of what I hear um, in, in your question is, um, you know, what's the role for refugees um, in, in non-Mexican contexts? Um, how do we facilitate, how do we understand social cohesion over time? Is it a function of the type of migrant and the duration of their um, separation from their hometown? Or is it something that can be facilitated as your, as your first book illustrates um, by the state, right, in creating um, um, a diaspora. I mean, I don't know if Katrina's on the call, but um, I know her work is really trying to look at this, the ways in which migrants create states, but states also uh, are creating diasporas. Um, we've seen that with the Italian diaspora as well, right? This idea of belonging. So I, I take your question and I think it's a really important one um, for, for, you know, maybe expanding the role of migrant agency um, beyond what we traditionally think is being the kind of the loyalists. Well, thank you so much, Lauren, and, and thank you also, Abigail, for, for your comments. Uh, to everyone, please join us next week for a Divided by the Wall, conservative, sorry, progressive and conservative politics at the U.S.-Mexico border, and we will continue the discussion. Have a good week, everyone. Thank you.